Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya, a project manager by profession, and I am interested in learning about the impact we have on the environment and society and in turn how we are shaped by it. And I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a passion for social and environmental sustainability. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we can create a world that is not just sustainable, but one that thrives. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia, as well as First Nations people across the globe. Today's topic for the podcast is Green Cities. I would like to introduce today's guest, Noelia Castro from Argentina. She has completed her bachelor's degree in international relations and has a master's degree in public administration. She has a deep interest in sustainability and sustainable practices and works as a trainer at Thrive. Hi, Noelia. Thanks for joining us again. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Maybe we could just start with understanding like, what's the definition of a green city or how we perceive green city. Yeah, so when we talk about a green city, we are talking about an urban environment that is designed with a, st- a strong focus on sustainability, environmental health, and the overall well-being of its residents. So it basically aims to strike a balance between urban development and ecological preservation. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we can see different examples of green cities around the world. There's a few, um, say, leading cities in in Europe, I think in Norway, uh, Berlin in Germany, I think in Spain as well. And even in Australia, we have quite a few. Conservation of natural areas is one part of it, like very green, sort of ecologically are friendly, but also things like, um, you know, uh, ensuring that public transport can reduce uh, the carbon footprint. Um, I think things like electric, you know, buses and, and things like that and keeping the the air clean and it sort of has social benefits as well as ecological benefits. We're talking of green cities, there's probably no measures to say what constitutes a green city in terms of like how do we measure which is greener and which is less greener? Or are we still in the phase where there's still... It's still developing the concept of what clearly defines a green city. I think there are some indicators uh, specifically regarding, like, if, if, for, for, over a cross section of different areas. So, obviously, things like um, adherence to uh, United Nations SDGs is one aspect, but that would be broader, influenced by broader policy of, of the state or nation in which the city resides, obviously. But there are other factors like the amount of or different you know, policies regarding, you know, if, if you're able to cut down. You know, you know, natural areas, for example, like clearing, clearing uh, natural areas and, you know, the, the, the extent of conservation and things like, yeah, they have like uh, wildlife corridors in some cities. And um, there's also factors like, uh, oh, yeah, as well as obviously uh, protecting uh, ecological areas. There's also uh, the level of, um, as, as mentioned, things like uh, say electric buses or uh, public transport and uh, as opposed to the overall you know, impact of uh, transport and, and carbon emissions through, you know, the use of cars or lack of public transport. So I think um, things like that do give some pretty solid measurements. I think it's probably still in that phase where uh, there, there is a lot of changes already being made, but there are some definitely uh, leading cities in the world which, uh, you know, rank higher in terms of, say, conservation of, of green areas let's say um, and that's pretty tangibly like easy to to uh, measure but then there are other factors obviously regarding uh, adherence to SDGs more broadly there are obviously other areas too like uh, uh, for, uh, infrastructure for for waste management and um, and recycling so you know obviously some cities don't have this infrastructure at all or very limited and other cities uh, have a huge amount of uh, you know recycling you know using say uh, paper, uh, or recycled paper bags in shopping centres, for example, as a policy regard, as opposed to, say, plastic, etc. So, yeah, I think there's definitely some measurements um, and clear indicators, but, um, yeah, and, and some cities uh, seem to be leading ahead of others. So any experience of your life living in a smart-ish city? Um, and maybe what advantages do you think it had or what benefits that probably brought you and maybe in general what it brings? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, just speaking for myself, I live in Perth in Western Australia and uh, it's a fairly uh, modern city. What I've noticed um, is that there is a lot of uh, conservation uh, areas, so natural um, uh, parks or lakes or whatever, et cetera, different green areas. And these obviously, I think, have a pretty good impact on not just obviously the ecological area and the different uh, conservation of different species, whether it's birds and other wildlife, but uh, in, say, uh, the wetlands, uh, which are uh, protected areas. There's also um, a huge amount of social benefits in that regard. I think uh, the impacts on mental health and, and well-being. There probably are some obvious, like where I, I live, where uh, whether it's, say, main roads or construction of roads, et cetera, where other factors need to be considered more strongly uh, as opposed to, you know, in terms of infra infrastructure and the ecological considerations that need to be made. So, as again, it, it can be um, policy driven by, you know, political and economic interests can sometimes outweigh the ecological interests. But I think, generally speaking, there's a, quite a lot of mindfulness about that. And uh, just another example, for example, when I had um, uh, been working in the city, uh, you know, within the last year, uh, one thing I did, had noticed was the use of, uh, uh, yeah, as mentioned, electric buses, which not only are obviously more ecologically friendly or environmentally friendly, but they have a more, let's say, pleasant experience in terms of, you know, noise pollution and so forth. It's much quieter and more, it just that, that sense of feeling more efficient. I think the other thing would be, um, yeah, just the, the the overall benefit of people within living within cities being in in uh, contact with you know a natural environment. Yeah, me for example, I'm from Argentina, and I can only speak about Buenos Aires city, which has been working in the last few years on more sustainable sustainable initiatives. Uh, like uh, maybe bicycle infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, there has been a lot of efforts to make to enhance uh, bicycle infrastructure, make uh, a lot of uh, bike lanes, also for public transportation. Um, it has been uh, extended, you know. Uh, but to this day, Buenos Aires it's, it's uh, considered one of the um, cities in Latin America with the lowest, uh, with the least green spaces in the city. So, which has contributed to the heat of the of the city. Yeah, I think I can uh, a bit relate because I, I grew up and mostly uh, worked also in India and in the south of India in a city which, well, initially probably used to be more, more green in the sense that it was less populated. I remember a lot more green spaces and lakes and you know uh, parks that that people went to and relatively empty roads, uh, with very few I think public transport that everybody used, but it has grown into being in one of the, I think the highest number of motorcycles or motorbikes used because the traffic is so bad with the cars that the people now have the highest number of motorbikes, and relatively there is very few people that you really go into parks anymore and you really have to travel a lot further away just to you know get a lung space that's breathable so i think i've had experience kind of trying to see that city change and then like i've lived in sydney where there is a lot more focus on on the natural environment of course the beaches but also quite a bit of hikes and conservation including uh, areas that used to be uh, mined before and have now been converted back into uh, lung spaces so that's always like a, a good sign I think the efficiency of a public transport system, uh, as we've been speaking, and less private is one of those big signs of seeing that you're green, but also removing congestion, which I guess creates less less chaos for people. Um, so that's, I think, mostly been my experience. And I, I relate to uh, uh, Michael's uh, point about, you know, silence and, and a little more um, niceness that comes with electric and any other form of transportation that gives you a bit of, you know, sense of calm, which is almost impossible in cities if if you live in the chaos of it. I have seen myself, for, for example, change by being extremely outdoor when I was growing up to later, just trying to, you know, find a space where you can just breathe and relax at the end of the day. Um, so I think in terms of regular mental like effect and mental well-being is that there is less chaos um, and you kind of hear yourself better. Um, what are what are any other um, natural conservation experiences that you've had, and how cities, which usually 
are extremely crowded, dense economic hubs can find a way to uh, create smaller wildlife corridors. Any ideas or experience with that? Yeah, so for me, in the last couple of months, I've been living in Shanghai, for example, and even though you're in the middle of the city and you have these gigantic uh, parks, but as you mentioned before, when the city is so crowded, uh, you're maybe in the middle of the park and even though you cannot see the, the, the highway, you can hear all the time the cars and the, and the noise from the, it's either the highway or the metro because they, the metro there is not underground. So you can hear that all the time. So it's noise pollution continuously. So even though um, there's so many things you can do to make the city more sustainable, uh, there's a lot of other things that needs to be taken into consideration, you know? I think that's it. It's like there's also a big corresponding uh, impact from my own experience, I think, and, you know, from what, what can be observed. But also I think there's been a few studies showing a link between mental well-being and yeah, green cities. I think yeah, there was one study which I could uh, we could uh, reference, which uh, talked about uh, a study of of people with uh, mental. Uh, I think it was mental health, uh, looking at their mental health and well being, and the the study found that those uh, in greater proximity to natural areas uh, ended up uh, with with better mental health outcomes over over a period of time, as opposed to those where uh, access to natural or green areas was, was less was more restricted and I think um, that does feed into the other areas as sort of Noelia was saying or, and as we were discussing before or things like noise pollution and just pollution in general and just that that impact on one's own uh, mental well-being and then the, the sort of community well-being at large and I think uh, there have been other studies talking about how within increasingly urbanized world how if most people are going to be uh, living within uh, cities that they need to be uh, made hospitable and part of the concern obviously is not, is things like crime naturally and safety but obviously that's going to be impacted upon you know through stress levels and other factors like you know noise pollution and you know the, you know air pollution just just well-being in general so in that through that sort of systemic uh, influences and uh, you know the holistic uh, factors but I think um, yeah so uh, they definitely see the the value and importance of uh, how uh, different strategies to mitigate, you know, air pollution and noise pollution, and uh, you know, to mitigate congestion, you know, of traffic, etc., uh, can abs absolutely assist with uh, mental well being and community well being as well. And I was just going to mention too, on top of that, you can see the impact with. Uh, say, uh, particularly with natural parks or natural cons conservation areas, how that has also economic benefits with, with uh, say, tourism. And um, just, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at, say, ecotourism, that, that's obviously something which should be uh, harnessed and used if, if the conservation areas are able to be um, sort of maintained, that, that it can bring in that eco ecotourism uh, uh, economic sort of, um, input, so you know, an injection of capital. So I think that's something uh, of of value as well. And, and kind of going back to uh, why we need green cities. I mean, beyond the mental health inputs and then environmental, I think maybe it might be worth defining that cities, as have almost eighty percent of the population of most countries, live in live in cities, and they generate waste, whether it is in terms of gases and industries and factories or it could be um, just even households in a smaller uh, area. There are a lot more houses that kind of cover the natural environment. There is roads and uh, creating heat in depth and without having, uh, and, and as a result, it's reliant upon the rest of the, you know, uh, landmass beyond the cities to actually provide the breathing and the clear air space in which you could finally breathe. So it becomes important because you're, a smaller hub that is consuming a lot of energy, a lot of resources, whether it's water being redirected from different places just so it's available for cities. All of these are aspects that make it important that you take more attention to it than you would say if you lived in a remote village with 
pretty much mostly in a natural environment. You wouldn't really naturally think about having a green city, but as but living in cities is extremely important to consider the impact that you have. Um, and everything around you, predominantly you don't have access to nature unless you go out and specifically, you know, go to a spot reserved just so you can go into the park and come back. And the rest of the time you are living pretty much in not so natural environment. So encouraging a way of keeping our cities green is also providing more of lung spaces for people who live inside, but also broadly, I would say, you know, the places we live in. Any um, other examples of cities that you've seen which have not been doing well? I mean, I could probably uh, just share a small example uh, where I live. I mean, generally speaking, it's pretty good, but definitely things like uh, a construction of, of roads where there is already, um, let's say, uh, pre-existent natural areas. Uh, and that sort of, I kind of alluded to that before, uh, disregard of ecological conservation areas. And uh, it, let's say they should be conservation areas, or they, uh, uh, but they may not be uh, through legislation currently. But there is obviously, you know, things like endangered species and just that ecological factors there to be considered uh, regardless. And um, yes, yeah, so I think things like that, um, constructing roads, uh, an infrastructure of that kind, I think that needs to, I've seen examples of that um, where there's been a bit of a disregard and there's been uh, a whole whole range of factors such as, you know, water uh, damage, the um, impacts upon um, yeah, underground uh, water and, and things like that and just uh, threats to uh, different uh, threatened species. So I think that needs to be uh, considered. On the flip side of that, I think too, as mentioned, um, Australia, say for example, is is you know, most of the cities are, uh, or most of the population really is, uh, you know, living on the coast. And I think even things like uh, natural areas, like in terms of the, the beaches, and the, I mean, I live not far from uh, a famous uh, tourism uh, beach, uh, or sort of newly famous uh, in Western Australia, where there's a lot of tourists. But obviously, a lot of the attraction is. Um, that uh, infrastructure has been uh, implemented to kind of harness that, you know, the the attraction of the, the obviously the beach and the natural uh, impact of that. But if it's done so in a way which doesn't isn't uh, disadvantage or doesn't disadvantage the, any uh, natural any parts of the natural world, I think that's where it, um, it it is beneficial. And you can see that where you know things like sand dunes and you know there are there is that conservation of, of those sort of areas knowing that there are um, uh, different species that live within 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 that environment yet that it can still be a uh, massively profitable uh, tourist area uh, nonetheless even whilst keeping within those uh, parameters of uh, at least purportedly and hopefully um, not impacting on the natural world yeah and as I mentioned before um, in Buenos Aires there's not that many green spaces and the government, Actually, um, they enacted a lot of uh, laws um, trying to urbanize all of the parks, not all of the parks, but lots of parks uh, or uh, empty spaces. Instead of creating parks, they are advocating for more construction, more urbanization. And I believe that the best that we can do, right, and this is happening in Buenos Aires, is a uh, protest. The people started protesting. Uh, this uh, drew the media attention, and yeah, this ended up uh, making the the government to back down a little because yeah, they knew that if they kept doing that, uh, they're gonna have the the opposition parties, uh, so to say, jump in. You know, so I think that that's something that we can do as citizens as individuals uh, participate in the community and try to avoid things to happen. Yeah, I think uh, as individuals, because we live in cities and there's a, con a society, a community that can come together, uh, like you said, to raise flags or even bring in initiatives and pitch it to your local politician or, or, or the system that can take in those feedbacks is something that we can easily do. Uh, secondly, I think there are certain initiatives that you could just do in your own neighborhood. Say there is probably not enough uh, um, composting, food waste, and others just goes directly into bin, gets collected, and it's probably thrown in a landfill. It's probably taken somewhere further away, and that itself is not efficient. You could probably have a street level 
composting energy you could have something that you know feeds back into your garden and could be a part of something is there anything else that people could do just to ensure that their cities turn greener and also how to support these yeah i'm not entirely sure uh yeah i suppose that that, that is an aspect of community level um sort of initiatives is obviously one part of it i think um throughout most of australia or certainly in western australia where i live um uh at least when it comes to you know there is um a good amount of recycling with you know plastics and and so forth and uh green green waste in general but yeah like you're saying i think those other community driven initiatives um you can you see sometimes in in different areas but just as regarding um other uh sort of community action i mean th there is a few examples i can think of definitely where people have banded together when they felt that um, nature reserves are were under threat where there were different developments um proposed uh and i'm talking about let's say not actual conservation areas protected not not say national parks which might be protected naturally but just con areas which generally uh you know have a, have an eco you know an ecosystem uh, whereby there's been a lot of community backlash when there's been a, a development proposed and that, that's that been uh, pretty effective and actually halted uh, different developments. There's also things I uh, just I mentioned before about the, the coastline. I remember a few years back um, uh, in Perth uh, when there, there had been a few uh, shark attacks and one of the uh, previous governments actually proposed a, uh, a large uh, shark cull you know, to because uh, there was great white shark had had attacked. There, there'd been a couple of attacks, and the community response was again quite significant to say, you know, you don't <laughs> we encroach upon the you know going into the ocean. We don't then you should not be then going and having a shark cull when when obviously that's what you know that's what sharks do. If if we go into the into the ocean, obviously for for recreation. So there was another example of um, say community action in that regard. So both of the examples, I suppose. I can think of uh, more in regard to yeah, uh, conservation of natural areas or you know or or different species, I suppose. Yeah, and I think one of them that I have seen is um, the city where I used to live, where again rapid urban urbanization and bringing metro trains and all sort of constructions. There was a metro line that went straight through the heart of where uh, the biggest parks were, and complete streets that are dotted with a lot of uh, trees on both sides. And uh, the planning uh, at central level planning was to go through those streets because they are very central to the line and make them the shortest and the most efficient. And it had to be communities coming together and saying this is not okay, but also working with them to see that we need to bring more efficient systems of transportation, but we also need to conserve the areas we have around it and come to some kind of a mutual agreement and then have uh, still have the metros being built, but in a way that it does not completely obstruct um, the current kind of lung space that, that exists in the city. Um, I, I think beyond that, there is there is also an opportunity, like we did mention, cities exist because they are also a, a great hub for economic opportunities. And I think a green city is also something that can be viewed as an opportunity by you know designers and innovators who want to, uh, can look at different solutions and when there's a large number of people, there is a big market for things that you could promote going further. Um, so there is a lot more that I think people can do to try and think of ways to support the initiative, but also probably look at it as an opportunity to make progress. And just like we talked about how uh, bringing a circle economy is a, a huge opportunity for industry, so is bringing green, green cities. There are newer materials with which streets can be built. There are uh, different ways in which you could probably electrify your uh, your own streets or products that you make can be more green and broadly contribute to how the beautification of the city changes based on what you make. So I think there are quite more things that that someone could do um, to make their move to make their city more green, while also, of course, knowing that a city is not managed by a single person and needs a much more um, organized effort. Uh, is there anything else that we want to talk about or maybe ideas that you want to share about smart cities or examples that are worth sharing? Yeah, I just think, um, you know, if as mentioned earlier, where we have a few leading examples. I know in um, a couple of countries uh, in Northern Europe, I think it was in Berlin was one example, where I th just greater levels of care are made to say, even if a, if a tree is to be cut down on a street, 
you know, greater levels of permission are required. So I think that's the kind of approach that a lot of uh, places should kind of should take. There needs to be at that policy level greater. I mean, so people will see that as very inhibiting, obviously, which it is. But I think when we're talking about conservation areas or, or green cities just generally, I think we needs to be looked at across the board uh, sort of holistically. You know, there, there will be national parks, which obviously are conservation areas, but there will be other areas which should which sort of act as conservation areas um, without necessarily um, being, uh, you know, not threatened by any other other impacts. But but I think there needs to be stricter laws um, and, yeah, stricter laws in general just to, to ensure that, uh, you know, processes that, that, that just to protect sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the natural uh, world, just even within cities like like on a, on a neighbourhood street with, with cutting down trees, et cetera. And I think also, too, there needs to be harsher laws, I think. I think we've I've seen personally, too, a couple of devastating impacts where uh, whether it's to do with negligence, uh, uh, through uh, infrastructure you know, developments, like through uh, creating roads, etc., and some of the the impacts on endangered species, and even uh, as some would say, uh, things like um, uh, as well as things like fires and you know terrible uh, impacts like that, there needs to be better, uh, stronger, I think, repercussions, and certainly for you know, obviously for any uh, intentional you know, criminal. Acts, acts can uh, affecting the natural world. There needs to be, you know, like things like arson, etc. I think there may, needs to be much stronger laws uh, penalising that because, um, you know, th these are areas which I think need to be uh, considered. I think there's been a few examples um, globally of of different constitutions having uh, proposing that uh, ecosystems have rights in themselves. So, in the same way as we have human rights, that ecosystems should be afforded rights and to, to, to not be, uh, let's say, subject to any, you know, violation, so to speak. But I think there needs to be stronger laws uh, protecting these and stronger repercussions for any any breaches of, of this as well. Yeah, also, um, maybe both responsibly, you know. I don't, uh, right now in Argentina, we have um, the new president. He basically doesn't believe in uh, climate change. So, yeah, um, educate ourselves. Um, and voice our concerns, you know? So, yeah, we. this is a way that I think we can uh, together uh, stop and improve. So, yeah. And yeah, I think we're a lot of time. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Nelia, for, for having this discussion today. Thank you guys for having me again. Yeah, thanks, Kavya. Thank you, Noelia. Uh, good to have this discussion. And I hope this kind of encourages people to have more such discussions in their own groups and especially about your own cities and things that you can do together um, as well as individually. We look forward to more discussions on, on broader topics and sustainability. And as we say at Thrive, uh, keep on thriving. <laughs>